Okay, let's unpack this then. We've been looking at an article about um, a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, it was between Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, and Brian Keating, the physicist. Right. They had this chat in Vancouver, apparently, and the article suggests it was, well, pretty wide ranging. Definitely. Covered everything from, you know, basic biology and evolution all the way to technology, consciousness, even uh, the future of reality itself. So our goal here, our mission for this deep dive is to sort of pull out the really key insights, maybe the surprising bits from that specific discussion. Exactly. Not just summarize, but figure out what stands out and, you know, why it matters for you listening. Get the essence of it. Right. Distill it down. Right. Okay. So... Here's where it gets really interesting. Where should we start? Maybe something fundamental like uh, sleep. Sleep sounds good. It's universal. And the standard view, the one most people know, is all uh, about physiology. Yeah, you know, rest, letting the body repair itself, brain consolidation, memory stuff. Seems obvious. It does feel intuitive. You feel better after sleep. But Dawkins, in this chat, he came at it from his uh, core evolutionary perspective. Darwinian sleep, how does that work? Well, he linked it back to something really basic, the day-night cycle, the Earth spinning. Okay. How does the planet rotating become the main reason for sleep? His argument basically is that day and night created totally different environments. So organisms evolved to specialize. Some got really good at daytime stuff. Hunting, foraging, and the light. Exactly. And others adapted for the night. Yeah. So if you're a daytime creature, night is, well, it's dangerous. Right. Your senses aren't attuned. Maybe predators are out that are better in the dark. Precisely. So from that evolutionary angle, Dawkins suggests sleep is primarily a strategy to, and I think the article quoted him as saying, avoid mischief. Avoid mischief. So just lay low when you're not well adapted. Yeah. Stay out of trouble during the time you're least effective and most vulnerable. Shelter somewhere. Stay inactive. Huh. So all the repair and restoration we think of, that's not the primary driver in his view. It's more like a side effect. That's the key distinction he made, according to the source. The physiological needs are important, absolutely, but they might be secondary consequences that evolved because we were already inactive for long periods. Wow. Okay, that is a genuinely surprising way to think about something so routine. It really shifts the perspective, doesn't it? It does. And speaking of fundamental things, they also talked about how we understand science itself and how we teach it. Ah, yes. Dawkins apparently had some uh, strong views on making science relevant all the time. Relevant? What's wrong with that? Don't we want science to apply to our lives? Well, his concern, as reported, was that constantly trying to tie every scientific idea back to some mundane, everyday application. Like physics and coffee cups or biology and diets. Right. He feels that approach can actually devalue science. He apparently argued that everyday life is often well, mundane, whereas science itself is inherently profound and exciting. So its value isn't just in practical application, but in the understanding it gives us, the big picture. Exactly. The goal of science education, in his view, should be more about inspiring that sense of awe and wonder about the universe, about life itself, not just, here's how it helps you. That makes sense. Aim for the wonder, not just the utility. That seems to be the takeaway from his comments in the article. And, you know, thinking about his impact, the article mentioned Brian Keating's introduction of Dawkins. He sort of set the stage. He did. Keating apparently highlighted some of Dawkins' major works, you know, The Selfish Gene, The God Delusion, his newer stuff, too. Books that really shifted thinking for a lot of people. Absolutely. And Keating also pointed out his broader cultural influence, like coining the term meme, in its original context, mm. and just being a massive public voice for science. The article also mentioned Keating praised his, quote, intellectual courage and refusal to pander, which uh, fits with the directness of these ideas we're discussing. It certainly sets the expectation for challenging viewpoints. Okay, so from biology and science education, the conversation apparently took a more existential turn. Yes, moving into reflections on life's value. Dawkins brought up an idea he's known for from unweaving the rainbow, I think. Oh, the lucky ones idea. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. That's the one. It sounds jarring at first. Lucky to die? How? The rest of the thought is crucial. It's because the number of potential pe combinations of genes and circumstances who could have existed but never will, that number is astronomically larger than the number of us who actually do exist. So just the sheer odds against being born at all. Exactly. Life isn't the default. It's presented as this incredibly rare, statistically improbable event. 
a privilege almost. So the fact that we get to experience life, even though it ends, makes us lucky compared to the near infinity of possibilities that never happened. That's the core of it. It's meant to foster this sense of gratitude, a kind of cosmic humility. And you know, for you listening, thinking about life as this rare gift might change how you see your own time here. That's, yeah, that's a powerful perspective. But it wasn't all framed that positively, was it? The article mentioned antinatalism came up. Right. The idea that maybe fewer people or even no people should be born, often linked to concerns about suffering or environmental impact. And Dawkins' reaction to that? The article describes him finding it tragically pessimistic, which makes sense given his view of life as beautiful and meaningful precisely because it's so rare. A total clash of perspectives there, gift versus burden. And interestingly, that philosophical point then led into a discussion about a very real-world biological trend. Declining fertility rates. Yeah, specifically mentioning the issue of falling sperm counts. Though, the article notes, Dawkins said, the causes for that are still unclear. Wow, so from the potential non-existent billions to the actual decline in births, quite a leap. It is, and that kind of leads us into maybe the most... Uh, speculative part of their discussion. The simulation idea. Are we living in a computer simulation? It's Nick Bostrom's hypothesis, yeah. A topic Keating explores often. Dawkins' view, according to the article, he apparently finds it hard to disprove. So not dismissing it out of hand. No, more like acknowledging it as conceptually interesting, even if it sounds like pure sci-fi. Hmm. It pushes the boundaries of what we think reality is. Did they offer any way to make that idea feel less abstract? Yeah, there was this great little anecdote mentioned. Dawkins talked about his mother being completely amazed by an early iPhone. Okay. How does that connect? He used it as a metaphor, like the phone accesses this huge external network, a cloud. What if our brains, our consciousness, are somehow connected to something bigger, something external, perhaps within a simulated framework? Ah, uh, I see. The brain as an interface to a larger system, potentially. It's a way to think about it. And the article pointed out this naturally led them to admit the, quote, limitations of human understanding when we tackle huge questions in cosmology or neuroscience. We just bump up against what we can know right now. Pretty much. And, uh... Never one to miss a chance for some cultural commentary, Dawkins apparently quipped. If this is a simulation, why are there so many Kardashians? Oh. Okay, that definitely brings it back down to Earth. Or maybe questions the simulation's designers. Right, but that simulation idea connects directly to another theme they hit, on the speed of technological change. Makes sense. If we can imagine simulating universes, our tech must be getting pretty wild. Exactly. Keating apparently brought up that classic comparison. Wright Brothers' first flight to the moon landing. Only 66 years. It's staggering acceleration. Which inevitably leads to the question. Are we nearing a technological singularity? That point where AI or tech just skyrockets beyond our comprehension or control. Yeah. Where technology might fundamentally alter humanity. Mm -hmm. Or even, as the discussion apparently framed it, eclipse biology. Did they answer that? The article suggests it was left as an open question. More about posing the possibility, thinking about... AI, post-human futures, that sort of thing. Wow. Okay. So we've gone from, like, the evolutionary roots of why we yawn and go to bed. All the way to maybe living in a giant computer program run by super advanced beings, while our own tech races towards maybe surpassing us. That is quite the journey, just from one conversation captured in an article. It really shows the richness of their discussion. You get these surprising takes on biology, strong views on science education, profound thoughts on life's value. Contrasting views on pessimism, and then these huge, mind-bending ideas about reality and technology. And hopefully you listening have picked up some unique perspectives on these fundamental questions, all drawn from this specific dialogue. Definitely food for thought. It reminds me, the article also mentioned another one of Dawkins' witty lines but yeah. about refusing certain debates. He apparently said something like, that would be very good for your CV, not so good for mine. Ah, vintage Dawkins, a reminder to choose your intellectual battles, maybe. Indeed. So, reflecting on all this, we've got the idea that life is incredibly statistically rare. Uh-huh, a precious anomaly. Paired with the maybe possibility that this rare existence is actually a simulation. A construct, yeah. All while our own technology is accelerating towards something potentially transformative, the singularity. So putting those pieces together, the improbable gift of existence, the possibility of it being simulated, the rise of potentially eclipsing technology. How does that maybe shape what you personally decide is important? 
what you choose to build or explore or just value during your own brief improbable time? That's the question to ponder, isn't it?